Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you happen to be. This is Peter Cox welcoming you to Litopia's all new pop-up submissions for the 10th of June 2018. Although we've been doing pop-up submissions for, oh, nine months or so, this is our most ambitious incarnation yet. So ambitious, in fact, uh, that we're going to need a few pilots, I think, just to ease our way into the proceedings and if you're a member of latopia writers colony you can join in the live chat link inside the colony uh, we're streaming on latopia's facebook page and also on our youtube channel too first time um, and while you're welcome more than welcome actually to make any comments you want to on facebook and i'd say you're entitled to make comments because after all we're going to be making comments on your writing um, you should be aware that only comments made in Latopia's own chat room will make it on the air. Uh, Pop-up submissions is all about demystifying the submission process. You can watch live as I and my guests from the publishing business discuss their vital first impressions of your manuscript. So let's introduce our guest for today. Uh, kindly joining me on this inaugural pilot show, just to help iron out the wrinkles a little bit, is famed Litopian Ali Gardner. Hello, Ali. <laughs> Hello, Peter. How are you? It's uh, very good to be talking to you again. It's been uh, been oh, some time, hasn't it? It has, yes. No, it absolutely has. Too yeah. long, too long. Too long. So we're going to come back to you um, in a few moments, Ali, and uh, learn a little bit more about you and your writing and everything Definitely. else like that. Um, but now, I think we should probably meet our first submission. <laughs> And this is called Alicante. It's a crime thriller by Jim Hamilton. Um, Jim has sent some interesting information. He served in the Royal Navy in the Fleet Air Arm. Um, engineering jobs in the private sector. Eight years as a language teacher as well. So let's have a look at the, um, the blurb that he sent. Now, I just need to apologise uh, because we've, we've recently changed the blurb setting on the website. You could, until a few days ago, send blurbs of any length at all. And obviously, blurbs are not supposed to be very long. I think we've restricted it now to something like 150, 200 words. So if you did send a longer one in, I'm sorry, but um, we are, we've probably truncated it. Let's just read this. Alicante. Uh, the Mediterranean city of Alicante in Fiesta is the backdrop to the story of Raoul Bergbergal's transition from obsessive sociopath to sexually deviant psychopath. A simple refusal was all it took, but when he reached breaking point, there was no going back. A murder carried out in a fit of pique soon becomes much more, as his enjoyment of the sadistic acts he carries out awakens a monster inside. Raoul is slaying with apparent impunity, and it's down to Inspector Carlos Rico to end his horrific killing spree by interpreting the symbols left at the crime scenes. As the body count rises, so does the personal nature of their relationship with the Alicante assassin. While the... Hmm, with the Alicante assassin is on the loose, I think I would have uh, probably edited that a bit, um, no one is safe. OK, so let's get into the... Uh, first few hundred words so he was just an odd job man in a holiday hotel but that didn't give her the right to treat him the way she did usually he slopped out in the kitchen sometimes he helped with deliveries but on the odd occasion he had the opportunity to work with the clients and this was the part of the menial job that he enjoyed most he'd been there for six months and this was the longest he'd ever held a job down Taking orders wasn't his strongest suit, and none of his previous employers seemed to appreciate his comments on their management styles. In the hotel, he had a degree of anonymity. After all, he wasn't stupid. He just didn't have the precious piece of paper that employers looked for. To spend a few days as a page not only gave him the chance to meet people, it also helped financially with the generous tips he could embarrass the clients into giving him. As if I would. 
was what she said all too loudly in front of her friends when asked if she would like to meet for a drink. They laughed at him, and he knew then that this was far from over. This wasn't a unique response for him. In fact, it was what he'd come to expect over the years. Raoul Bergbegel was 26 and considered himself typically Spanish. He was 5 foot 10 with dark brown hair and eyes. Mediterranean complexion and of average looks and build, but there was something about him girls didn't like. He'd been called creepy, weird, and described in many other derogatory terms. However, he knew that they were all wrong. Letitia was wrong. Room 213 was the final straw for Raoul. Letitia was finishing the room when Raoul carried the Louis Vuitton luggage for the handsome, well-dressed client. He placed the bags on the appropriate rack and went through the expected routine of asking if there was anything more that Sir wanted. Sir played along, thanked him, and pressed a five-euro tip into his hand. Letitia drew his attention to the fact that she was just finishing his bed and would be gone in a few moments. So a question about his bed preferences was as loaded a question as she could possibly have asked. And accompanied with the exaggerated bending of the waist, revealing far too much leg, she left the client in no doubt that she was available. He smiled and rose above her titillation. He had far too much to do and I counted to be sidetracked by a chambermaid. Raoul, however, had reached her watershed. The, this girl needed to be taught a lesson. She was nothing special, he thought, but she had turned him down. <laughs> and minutes later was flirting with a complete stranger just because he was rich. As a Tunisian, he expected her to have traditional Muslim values, but Letitia seemed to be looking for a way off of the bottom shelf she'd come from. Her looks were average. Of 5'4", her figure was as expected of a 20-year-old girl, and she was popular with her workmates. When Raoul saw Mr. 213 leave the hotel, he took the opportunity to, to use his passkey to the second-floor room. The note that he left on the bed was brief and to the point. 10 o'clock on the fourth-floor bar of the casino, Richard. Raoul was certain that the grasping little whore wouldn't miss such an opportunity. He locked the room and called a room service. Wow. So then, Ali, first impressions, uh, I'm going to ask you, um, do you want to turn the page or do you want to disengage? I, I think it's an interesting premise. I, um, there's certainly an awful lot going on and you do have this promise of, of more to come and, and certainly a, a huge build up from the blurb in terms of the potential for the story. I just found that was quite a block of text actually. Yeah. And I do wonder if that was the best 600 words, whether perhaps the story should have started somewhere else. You know, we did seem to have quite a backstory dump and maybe maybe a bit of breaking up with some dialogue. You know, yeah. I mean, we've got one yeah. phrase in there, but it, it really is... A block. It's quite difficult even to look at. Mm. Um, we're, we're given a bit of the character in, in some of um, what he thinks, um, but I don't think things like the physical descriptions, they seem to be fairly ordinary people. It'd be quite nice to have them sort of slightly quirky or a bit stranger, you know, I don't know, not quite missing a left ear, but you yeah. know what I mean? Something a little, yeah. little, little more than just typically Spanish, as it were. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think it has a lot of potential, but I think I would want it polished before I, before I read on. Okay, be that's, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, I uh, thank you very much. By the way, we've got the chat room on the screen now. Um, interesting to to watch their comments. I wish. I mean, sometimes I wish I could just watch the chat room all the time. Actually, just shut up. There's a lot of wisdom <laughs> in the chat room. Also, a lot of humour and boredomness too. Um, this is kind of. I was kind of. I've got to say, I was slightly more excited about the concept than the execution. Um, I thought mm. initially this would be good lightweight holiday reading always a mark of that kind of thing it's genre fiction but it still it sells you go on holiday you want to read something light and whatever a bit trashy maybe we do read trashy yeah, trashy stuff on holidays yep. um so i'd got it pegged i guess as a mixture between el dorado do you remember that el dorado on television Ooh. a soap opera set on the, the costa <laughs> If I say yes, do I show my age? Yeah, you do. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> oh, never mind. Uh, yeah, El Dorado meet, meets Seven, which is a very good film by David Fincher. Um, very scary about uh, about a psycho um, mass murderer. Um, mm. El, I, I mean, I think that's an interesting <laughs> concept, actually. El Dorado mm. meets Seven. Yes. Are you interested in that? Yeah. Would you like to see that submission? Yeah. The problem problem is with the execution. And it just, my, my initial reaction was is a bit mucky, actually. Um, mm. And thinking about it, I mean, Seven, I don't know why I'm particularly comparing it to Seven, it just came to mind. Um, seven was really quite nasty. 
Um, and it was quite graphic and unpleasant. But I think the thing, the difference is we want to be scared by that, by that sort of stuff. Um, mm. We don't just want to, you know, to feel, oh, this is kind of horrible. I think there's a, there's a subtle also, difference there. There was also a few inconsistencies, which again would need to be ironed out. You know, like things what? like the fact that he expected a particular answer, but this was actually also his crunch, his turning point. You know, this seemed to be the turning point for the whole book, you know, her refusal. Um, or that's what appeared to be setting up as. Yeah. And you think, well, hang on, if it's an expected response, it's also not your psychological turning point. So, that's you true. know, things like that, you know, perhaps could be ironed. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Okay, so we now have to decide. We've got uh, four or five options here. The one that... I guess everyone's aiming for is I want to call it in. So when we've got our publishing guests, I'm going to put them on the spot and say, guys, do you want to call this sub submission in? Or I could call it in if I want to see it as an agent. That's one <laughs> in the middle. Uh, we've got other options here. It's a near miss. Not my cup of tea. I'd rather watch paint dry. I'm afraid a lot of submissions that the trade sees are a bit dull. And then I guess the worst one is not with a barge pole. If you're American, uh, let me translate that for you. Not with a tent pole. So, Ali, what are you going to go for? <laughs> I'm going to go for a not my cup of tea. I'm not, not much into tea. psychopathic, but yeah, no. So no. It's, it's not quite my <laughs> You're too nice so. for that, aren't you? Not even on holiday? <laughs> not even on holiday? Not even on holiday, especially on holiday, yeah. Okay. So. I liked the concept. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, actually. But I like the concept. Um, a sort of El Eldorado meets Seven. I would definitely go for that. But... Uh, the execution didn't work for me, so it's not my cup of tea. Um, nevertheless, if you like that, you may be interested to know, you can get it on Amazon. And there it is. Golly. Mm. How about that? Gosh. Mm. Right, next one. Next one up is The Shape of Circle. Fantasy by Rich Joseph Adams. That's a name that's kind of familiar to me. I'm not sure why. Somewhat familiar. Um, let's have a look at the, um, the blurb. Guys, I do apologise for not making it absolutely clear that um, the blurb should be, you know, within certain word limits. I forget exactly what it is, but it's, it says on the website now, actually. In fact, it won't accept... Um, a blurb longer than the predetermined amount. So, you, and you can actually see there's a little counter device there that I just put on a few days ago. You can actually see the characters counting down to zero, which hopefully is quite helpful. So, Rich actually sent in a longer blurb, much longer, um, but there's not room for it, sadly. So, what we've got is this, which isn't bad, is it? The plague took her mother. The soldiers <laughs> took her village. Because you wrote it. I did not write it. <laughs> Well, somebody did. If Rich sent a longer one in, well, no, this is the beginning. This was the beginning, but the rest of it, I, I haven't had. I, I wasn't able to compress. The mountains took her baby, but the earth gave her something in return. That's all right, actually. I like that. Um, that works for me. Yeah, I think so. Definite drama. Mm. Yeah, and then the thing is that I think a lot of people get confused between a blurb and a synopsis. We do not want a synopsis. A synopsis is a technical document, as I keep on saying. It's a technical document. We don't want a synopsis. Um, if an agent or a publisher calls in your submission, they will want to uh, discuss the synopsis with you because that's really the structure of the thing. But what, what we're really focusing on now in the new pop-up submissions is the, the sizzle, the, the first impression that your title creates, the first impression the blurb creates, the first impression your writing creates. And that's really the door opener for you. If that works, fantastic. If it doesn't work, then the other 99,000 words are not really going to deliver anything for you. Um, let's, um, let's get this up on screen. Here we go. The blurb yeah. could have been four times that long in that time. It could have been, actually, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Here we go. 600-word excerpt. Heike laid a hand on her belly and felt for the kick of her twins. 
The babies hadn't moved for a while, but she couldn't blame them, what with all the bumping around. Her hand was caked in mud from the rice terraces. Dark skin showed through cracks and dried, pale mud. Her belly was huge on her tiny, tiny frame, but she was still a turn of the moon from giving birth. That's interesting language so far. She heaved the iron yoke higher up her shoulders and rebalanced the baskets of rice hanging at her sides. Two full baskets from the winter store in return for nine back-breaking days of spring planting. Stupid farming. The village would be better off hunting ibex on the slopes of the mountains. Not true, of course, but she was angry, which she hated. And late, which she hated even more. Her unborn babies twisted inside her and a tiny foot rippled her belly from rib to navel. Ah, there you are. The foot disappeared and dug into something it shouldn't, somewhere on top of her bladder. Hiker's knees buckled. Ow! Stop it! Stop it! Let me get there! She glanced up with a trail towards the pass in the mountains. Home lay in the valley beyond, 300 steps at the most. Quiet now, you two. We have to get back. Your grandfather will be needing his medicine. An inhuman squeal came from the brush at the trail edge, and a wild pig cra crashed out and collapsed in the dirt. A sow, pregnant. Flanks and hindquarters horribly mauled. Hiker swallowed her shock and dropped to a crouch. The rice basket thumped on the trail. Hiker steadied her breathing. Panic wouldn't help. She slipped off the yoke. Now what should we do with you, my pretty? The sow barked and thrashed her neck. She was panting fiercely and rolling her eyes. Some of the blood was not from her wounds. Wild pig mothers were notoriously protective of their young, and this one looked to be in labour. What did this to you, girl? Hiker scanned the scrubland. Dire wolves? Sabre cats? She edged towards the sow. Don't be frightened. Let me see. Sow hauled herself up and charged. Hiker sprang away, arms cradling her belly. The sow's strength failed, and she went to ground with a roar. Hiker approached the injured mother to be, palms out flat, to show she wasn't a threat. The sow squealed once, but the fight had left her. She would die, and so would her piglets. That was clear enough, but at least Hiker could offer some comfort and ease the beast's pain. Are you thirsty, girl? Hiker's mouth was dry, but the sow's need was greater. Would you like some water? She pulled a fistful of twigs from a pocket in her dress and cupped them in her hands. Their life force tingled against her skin. She breathed on them and pushed with her mind. The twigs burst into flame, collapsed into ash, glinted like metal and dissolved into water. How could, she, could shape the elements from beginning to end, from wood to water? Most couldn't, and few even tried. She brought her hands to the sow's mouth and poured in the liquid. The wild pig shifted its weight to lie on its side and stared up at her with pleading eyes. Hiker squatted low, lower, and their pregnant bellies brushed together. There was nothing more to be done. I can't help you, girl. Not in the way you want, but I promise your meat will go to good use. She slipped her knife from its sheath in the small of her back, leaned over the dying sow, and slit the beast's throat. Well, that's quite strong. That's strong. Hmm. Ali, Ali, first impressions. <laughs> turn the page or disengage? Oh, no, I'd turn the page, actually. I'd, you I'd turn the page? It's, 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 yeah, I would, actually. Yeah, me too. Um, I, yeah. I think the, the excerpt gives quite a lot of, of um, character. We, we know where we are roughly in time. Yeah. We know it's back yeah. then, although not exactly. We know roughly where we are in terms of, you know, somewhere rural and a fairly basic lifestyle um, and a fair bit about the character, you know, from, from how she reacts. You know, she's prepared to be kind and then slit its throat um, and, you know, her irritation at the beginning. Um, I also thought it was very useful... Um, using that dialogue, you know, talking to the unborn child to be able to break it up mm. and again brought out bits of her character. So, no, I, I thought that was well done. Um, yeah. There's a few bits of sort of tidying up grammar-wise um, and, you know, right at the beginning, for example, there's several words repeated, you know, like mud and belly. I think that could have been... It just felt a bit sort of like it um, could mm. be a bit more interesting at that point. Okay. Um, so uh, there was a certain amount of head hopping as well. We seemed to know what the wild pig was thinking, which is which is fine. Yeah. <laughs> we did, didn't we? To be tuned into wild pigs, yes. You don't um, actually work so in publishing, do you, Because so. you're giving a very professional <laughs> assessment here. Oh, I think yeah. we might just forget about the idea of publishers and having you on each oh. week. Oh, I'll be here every week. Don't worry. That's don't a very worry. good critique, Ali. We're impressed, actually. Wow. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh. Two um, several, sir. Good yeah. Call. Okay. So we, we're going to go straight to our decision moment so what are you going to pick oh now this is tricky how many am i allowed to call in i'll call this one in as many I'm as calling you want it in. as many as you want i'm it. calling this one in you're gonna yeah, call it in i'm calling it yeah i am actually hmm. okay 
Well, it's a shame you're not a publisher, isn't it? Actually, it's a great shame. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I have um, a good story in my hands today. <laughs> let's just look at the chat room. Yeah, uh, Rich Rider, Rich. I'm. I think that's absolutely. Before it goes off the page, turn the page. Mystery is very enticing, and I was not expecting the kill of the pig. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Um, I think I would have liked to hear her tone of voice and speech. I agree with that. I think that's a very perceptive comment, Rich. Um, we've got two riches there. Mustn't confuse Rich Rider Rich with Rich. <laughs> Tim says, well done, Rich. I call it into Barbara's yodeling. I think she's in Switzerland. Well, she's Swiss, I think. She's not in Switzerland. She's... Yeah. I think it's a good thing, yodeling. Um, I've got it. I mean, God, I, I, the only reason... I don't know. I'm, I'm actually not going to pick any of those. Um, and for my... For my sins, and this is the problem I've been explaining earlier because it's only a pilot, unfortunately. Um, I don't know how it develops, and I honestly would like to have had more indication. I think I think we pick up a lot of the world. It's interesting. Her powers are interesting. Um, I agree with the British writer Rich in his comment. I don't know what to think of this. I think the writing is pretty strong. Um, I'm I've got a blank. In terms of positioning, so you, <laughs> what is it? Where you is, where me would to it cast sit? my vote, and, <laughs> and then you're yes. faffing. This isn't fair. I'm faffing. <laughs> I'm faffing. You're right. I am faffing. Um, you're going to choose a hybrid, aren't you? <laughs> you're going to invent I, I a can't. New I can't. There are I only five coming. options. There. Um, <laughs> okay. Barbara's in the, in the UK. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I don't know. I would like. I'm. I'm actually going to look at that afterwards. So, Rich said something interesting, actually, because I've asked everyone to, um, who makes a submission just to put a little bit about themselves, right? And we, we won't use it all, we won't need it, actually. But um, Rich says, I write because I have to and because I want to entertain. Like, so, you know, when, whenever you come across somebody who, who feels like that, uh, you, know, you know you're dealing with a writer because people do write because they've got to. They really do. It's something, it's something genetic, I think. Um, that that's yeah, that really sort of you know rung a bell for me. So I'm going to look at the blurb, stroke synopsis afterwards. I'm reserving my judgment. That means you're calling it in. If you're looking at it again, <laughs> you're calling it in. <laughs> Why do? Why do? <laughs> Here we go, Cousins by Celia. <sighs> Ali, can you make a, an attempt to that, please? I can't. I, mean, I can only see Celia. Oh, you can't, you can't see the rest of it? Okay. I can't we've see got, the second name. We've got two no. different accents there. Celia, no, I'm going to say sorry. Nunez, Nunez, but I'm sure that's wrong. Nunez, Nunez. I don't know. Sorry, I literally can't see it. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is Cousins. Um, Celia's a very interesting person. Um, she studied self-defense, copywriter, um, counselor. Hmm. Let's look at the um, the blurb. Adele Ramos has a clear picture of who she is: an outspoken academic, a proud Chicana, and someone who can take care of herself. Then her grandmother dies, and Adela must return to her childhood home, the Texas border town of Laredo. There, she and her cousin Tara meet to settle her grandmother's estate. Encountering Tara again after so many years, Adela has trouble believing that the two of them are even related. Tara McFarland lives in the upscale community of Highland Park, Dallas, with her surgeon husband. She belongs to the Junior League and the DAR, D-A-R, I don't know what that is. She plans fundraising gars, sits on the board of her children's school. And she seems to have forgotten who her mother was. It's as if Tara has decided to wipe away half her ancestry. Okay. So let's get this up on the screen. I think this is a PDF, isn't it? Yeah, it's the only PDF we've got. Here we go. 
chapter one. Adela lay flat on her back pretending to sleep and listened to the sound of someone creeping up to her. Even though she knew who was, what was coming, she could feel her heartbeat quicken, feel the goosebumps rise on her arms. A moment later he pounced. She felt his weight on top of her, between her legs. Rough, heavy hands circled her throat. Her eyes flew open as she latched onto his wrist. She held his hands tight, pressing them against her collarbone. At the same time, her legs came up high. She hooked her ankles over his shoulders and pressed her heels down against him. A second later, her thighs were squeezing against his arms. What the hell, Adela? Sorry. Adela relaxed her legs. Really sorry. Are you okay? Just finish the lesson. Sure. Adela turned her head to face an audience of about a dozen college-age women. Once, you've, once you have your attacker trapped, you want to squeeze your thighs together as hard as you can, she told them. There's a chance he'll try to pull back, which is why it's important to keep your ankles locked down on his shoulders and your hands tight on his. Ideally, you don't want to release the hold until you hear his bones break. She looked up at the man looming over her. I think that's enough. You think? He got off of her, and they both stood up. Any questions? Adela asked the, cl the class. One of the seated women raised her hand. But is it really enough, you know, in a real-life situation? Adela smiled. My uncle taught me this move. He used to be a cop, and he's seen it work. And you can see why. Women use their core to push out babies. Damn right you can use it to break someone's arms. The women in the class nodded as this bit of information sank in. Adela looked around the room. All right, partner up. Take turns being the attacker and the fighter. Adela hated the word victim and practice this move at least five times each josh and i will walk around and check your technique as the students arranged themselves in pairs adela gave them one more piece of advice remember this move is pretty straightforward trap your attacker and crush him like a bug at this point a 40 woman in sweats who'd been standing off to the side during the demonstration walked over to adela could i have a word okay Adela followed the woman out to the hallway and noticed that she closed the door behind her. This was not a conversation she wanted overheard, Adela realised. Is something wrong, Jennifer? Jennifer started Adela a moment before responding. What happened just now with Josh? I guess I squeezed a little too much. Uh-huh. And a couple of weeks ago I saw you flip Ben pretty hard? My hole slipped. I see. Adela could read the concern in Jennifer's eyes. Wait a minute. You don't think I'm hurting people on purpose, do you? No, not on purpose, Jennifer sighed. It's not just these incidents. The fact is, I have some concerns about your approach. What about my approach? Your language, for one thing. My language? Crush him like a bug. Kick his balls in. Pop his eyes out. Jennifer shook her head. This is supposed to be a self-defence class. And the best defence is a strong offence. If you break someone's arms, it makes it that much easier to escape, Adela huffed. These moves were developed by a cop. They work because they're based on the way attacks happen in the real world. I don't have a problem with your technique. It's your attitude I'm worried about. What do you mean? Jennifer put her hands on her hips. Look, Adela, I'm just going to say it. You're a good instructor, but something's going on. You seem to be forgetting that these are demonstrations, not actual attacks. I, I've seen this before. Women sometimes start self-defence because they've had a bad experience, and they don't ever want to go through that again. I support that. Hell, that's why I run this program. Adela wasn't sure where Jennifer was going <clears throat> with this, so she kept quiet. But that can make these classes difficult for some people. I've seen it happen, and I have to wonder if that's not what's going on here. Jennifer paused, took a breath. Look, if you have any unresolved issues from your past, it might be helpful to work on them with the counsellor. Adela's brows furrowed. No, I don't have any issues. Well, something's going on. In a softer tone, she added, you know, the university has an excellent counselling service. I think you, should, you could benefit from it. I took a moment for Adela to respond. I don't think that's really for me. Jennifer's expression grew stern. Then maybe teaching in my programme isn't for you, really for you either. Adela felt like she'd been punched in the gut. What? It's simple. I can't have you hurting the other volunteers, so get a handle on this or don't come back. I don't want to see you here again until you have at least two counselling sessions under your belt. She put a hand on Adela's shoulder. I'm sorry to be a hard ass, but I've got to protect the other volunteers. Fine. Adela wasn't sure whether she wanted to burst into tears or put her fist through a wall. Probably both. I guess I'll go then. That's probably a good idea. Adela stepped back into the studio just long enough to retrieve her gym bag. On the way out, Jennifer stopped her again. I want you to know 
I do want you back, but I really think there's something you need to tackle. Got it. And then Adela walked out of the studio, determined never to return. As soon as she left the building, Adela pulled out her phone and hit her familiar number. It was a relief when the call was answered after only a couple of rings. Mum, you're not going to believe what just happened, Adela blurted out. Oh, mijita. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> you haven't gotten any of my messages? What messages? I've been trying to reach you for the past couple of hours. I've been teaching self-defence class. In fact, that's what I wanted to... Adela, her mother's tone was quite firm, and it made Adela slow her pace towards the parking lot. Something's happened, her mother continued. Now Adela stopped on the sidewalk. What? There was a pause. It's Abuelita. Ha! Oh, huh. Okay. Kind of leave us wondering what's going on there. Um, turn the page. Disengage. Disengage. Why? Um, I, th I thought the premise was very good. I mean, she's got a good reason for a life switch, um, in, given in the blurb. And so there was a good reason to kind of go off and, you know, settle the estate, etc. Um, but that piece, you know, there was big drama at the beginning. You know, there was an attack and you thought, oh, something's happening here. Mm. But instantly deflated. It became as mundane as a self-defense class, which is actually fairly mundane. And then it was followed by a huge block of conversation that didn't really seem to say very much. I think that, that conversation could have been done in about a third of what we actually got um there was also the the sort of rhythm of it it actually seemed very repetitive rhythm adela said this uh, jennifer's brow furrowed blah 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 it, it seemed quite a sort of a, a repetitive almost monotonous rhythm so i think it would be nice to crisp it up and again maybe to start somewhere else where there actually was some real action rather than sort of almost pretend action i know that sounds mm. a bit odd so um oh, i can't think? disagree with any of that amber says in the chat room, it was easy to read, but I wasn't sure how it related to the blurb. I agree with that. And I think I think the, the linking, the, crucially, the linking thing that wasn't there for me was, didn't really get into a, bail, um, a dialer's head, actually. I mean, all, all I, just, I've got a very yes. external impression of her, and she's, mm. she obviously does have some issues. But other than having a few issues, who doesn't? Mm. Um, I didn't, I didn't get sucked into, I didn't get, I wasn't intrigued by, by the woman, and I didn't want to know much about her family. Katie says I turn the page so it could stand a rewrite. So, um, Ali, as our stand-in publishing person, what are you going to pick? I'm going to call it a near miss because I reckon with a bit of tightening up, it, it may not be a bad premise and the writing is actually, you know, there's a lot to it, um, but I think it needs quite a bit of tidying up. So I'm going to call it a near miss. That's a near miss for you. Okay. All right. Um, it's nearly a near miss for me. Um, <laughs> I think the fact that, um, well, you know, I mean, it, I, I, can, I, I, can, I can see, I can see what the aim is. I can see where you're going with this. Um, but it's not quite pushing the right buttons for this sort of family saga. Not quite. Um, we are going to... What we're going to do now is what I would normally do at this moment. I'm not going to take too long on this. And I'm going to leave the chat room up because the catchphrase. Yeah. Did you you notice the catchphrase, did you? Um, I'm going to say, Ali, uh, what we'd normally do at this stage is um, say to our publisher or actually bookseller. I'm really quite keen to have a few booksellers on too because they are at the ultimate end of the business. Um, so if there's anyone in the chat room or you know maybe watching the video on YouTube or Facebook live... If you're a bookseller, if you know someone who's a bookseller, want to want to come on, please do. Always really, really keen because I, I actually think even from my side of the desk, um, agents and publishers don't always hang out with booksellers enough, and we ought to. We really ought to. So I'm very keen to get booksellers on. Obviously, want to get um, publishers on too as guests. What we have at the moment is Ali, <laughs> our substitute, <laughs> our test, <Thanks. laughs> our test publisher. In inverted commas. So I would normally have um, have two or three minutes chatting about your imprint, but instead of which, I'm going to ask you what you like reading. Um, what do I like reading? Oh, yeah. it's quite a mixed bag because I write children's um, stuff. I do read an awful lot of children's stories. Uh, I've just finished Neil Gaiman's Graveyard Book, which I enjoyed very much. He's he does write a terrific terrific yarn, and and even if some of the stuff isn't quite your cup of tea, it certainly carries you. Um, I read quite a lot of self-help stuff. I quite like things on 
sort of low-grade psychology, nothing really tough. Um, I read one called, what was it, Eat, Move, Sleep recently, which is quite nice. It's supposed to change your entire life. I don't think mm. quite did that, um, but mm. it raised a few points. And then I read that Japanese woman's one on tidying. Oh, yeah. Which is quite yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember what it's called now, but yeah. uh, that was actually quite good fun. You probably, I, can't find, I, I bought it, I can't find it now. It's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's somewhere here. I don't know. That's why yeah, I need the she ladder. Hasn't been, she hasn't been through your house, no. Um, uh, and, and in fact, I'm reading something called The Treacherous Curse at the moment by Dina, somebody or other, I can't remember her second name. Hmm. Um, but it's actually made a strong a impression on you, didn't it, then? It, fantastic it's just you know seared into my soul yeah no i mean the book itself is actually quite fun it's a sort of lightweight mystery but she's done it with a lot of humor which which appeals to me greatly me too. Um, do you, you, so, so yeah. i mean you yeah you, you you're writing for children so do you, do you actually because yeah. a lot of people who do mm. write for whatever for children or whatever genre actually mm. don't read in that genre but mm. you, you find that's okay mm. yeah no i enjoy it actually i mean some of them a bit tedious or a bit predictable yeah. um but there's some there's some very good stuff out there so no i'm embarrassed to say how much i enjoy the children's books look what amber's done in the chat room she's absolutely astonishingly good oh well done form. yeah how about that the life-changing yeah, measure of tidying up the japanese art of decluttering yeah yeah, yeah was, i think that's perhaps a bit uh, <laughs> She emphasised her point a little too strongly, considering we are talking tidying, but uh, it was, it's yeah. fun to read, put it that way. Mm. Appeals to the ACD in us, does it? Mm. Yeah. But I quite often do that. You know, I'll be poking around and I'll think, actually, do you know what? That <laughs> sounds a little little odd. So, um, pick that up. So, it's a bit of a wide range. <laughs> Okay, I've been looking forward to this, actually, just from the title alone. I just had a little peek at the author's bio. Very interesting. Iman Munro. It's a middle grade space adventure called Space Trackers. Ooh. Now, let me just tell you about the author a little bit. Uh, the author has done parkour. Actually started life doing parkour pretty much. Um, and then when she's only done her research, she checked out uh, one of the world's leading parkour practitioners who was actually in one of those james bond films uh sebastian foucault and um she's been studying magnetic field data from voyager one and two it's pretty cool isn't it um mm, certainly doing your research <laughs> yeah i think that, um, i think she does that professionally actually because credibility yeah. and mm. she likes to portray women as strong science leaders in her novels which is all right that sounds Fabulous. quite commercial to me, actually. That's Magnet perfect. Mm. And Amber's saying magnetic fields are interesting. I'd like to know more about that. Um, so space trackers. Let's see if we can pick up some of those attributes in space trackers. Um, this is the... Oh, the gym, gymnast already, parkour coming in. This is the blurb that I'm sent. 12-year-old gymnast Seb Carter wants to become a tracker. His world has flipped upside down when his sister Grace died during tracker training. But when he realises that her death was no accident, he vows to locate the culprit and bring them to justice. However, the culprit offers Seb an opportunity that he cannot refuse. This leaves Seb with a moral dilemma that involves destroying his past and jeopardising the lives of everyone he loves. With zany creatures to capture, a black hole that could save them, an unstable planet and plenty of tuna sandwiches, <laughs> to fuel Seb and his team as they learn what it takes to become space trackers. <laughs> Well, you can't dislike that, can you? No, let's uh, let's have a look at the um, the manuscript of the first first few hundred pa uh, words. Here we go. Space trackers. Because Parker was made for space. Yeah, he was. Of course, he was. Absolutely, of course, he was. Yeah. Um, here we go. Chapter one. Forty-seven seconds to DIE. Seb Carter stood ready for the 20-storey descent to ground zero. The moment he'd been living for since the death of his sister Grace had finally arrived. Almost time. His heart raced ahead of his feet as he steadied his breathing control. Adrenaline kicked into gear through his system. It hyped him up for the one thing he focused upon, the route. 30 seconds. Thoughts flickered like a zooming slideshow with his mind's eye. With his mind's eye. Each obstacle appeared in turn as he mentally imagined tackling them. He'd chosen the route himself, and now he was ready. Ready to become a tracker. Grace died during tracker training, but he wouldn't. The biggest obstacle of them all wasn't the route itself, it was Barry Durrell. 
I don't know why I'm laughing at that. Barry, I just, I didn't expect to find Barry Durrell there, actually. Um, <laughs> no, the tracker gang something. leader, yeah, who hated him. If you really wanted to be part of the gang, this was it. From here on, only one way to go. Down. Five seconds. Pete and Susie were his only supporters as they watched standing from the starting line. The corridor was narrow and stretched both ends, with Barry and Seb facing opposing ends of it. A little bit of clunkiness going on here in the manuscript. Um, could have done with another one more read, I think. Go! Pete ordered, shooting his arm down like a guillotine, authorising descent in execution. That's D-I-E. Seb pounded the concrete corridor towards the stairwell, while Barry shot off in the opposite direction. At the stairwell, Seb leapt onto the windowsill. He crouched. Shards of glass crunched under his converses. Capital C there, it should be. As he grounded them, twisting carefully onto the outer ledge of the concrete block. Oh, got through that sentence. The chilly July air struck his face with a cold slap. Summers weren't what they used to be, if you remember them at all. Soot particles stained his hands when he touched the external carbon-stained walls. Two stains, though. So you've got to read this aloud, actually. Iman, read it aloud. You'll, you'll pick up these, these little things. He raised himself to full height, holding steady by leaning against the outer wall. He scanned the scene in front of him. The mishmash of flats and eyesores was the making of his estate. The grand concrete building is a common sight in the poor side. It reminded him how much his life had changed in less than a year. The estate was home now, an indirect site, two buildings away, north from his position, was his own residence. It was a small, dusty flat in a small compound with six high-rise buildings that housed thousands towering around it. Movement in the corner of his eyes alerted him to two darkly uniformed figures. It's kind of Ready Player One, actually. Um, attempting to break through reinforced walls of someone's residence. They had two small objects in their hands, gra hand grenades. Powerful and precise hand grenades that could rip through the reinforced barriers whilst keeping the destruction controlled within a tight spherical range. These were enforcement officers employed by the authorities. Their vested interest in keeping everyone in check was a deadly priority and specifically they ensured that nobody hoarded metals. Seb refocused on the route as he shook off the sight of the silhouetted figures. He shuffled as quietly as he could. Placing each foot carefully on the sloping ledge, he edged, ready to drop down, onto the next level. He skipped onto a privately owned balcony, taking care to land softly near the edge. He held the railings with both hands as exhilaration filled him. The thoughts of moving freely his own way, his own route, was enough to power his every leap with confidence and hope. The balcony railings were cold and rusty, where dry black paint covering the poles beginning to flake off. See, that's not quite right either. A savage bark come from within one of the flats. Right. So, there we are on page three already. And, Ali Gardner, what are you going to be? <laughs> Turn that page or disengage. Oh, I, mm, I, I think this is actually quite a tricky one because, you know, the premise is good and, and, you know, in theory it's a very exciting start. He's just about to literally risk his life um, and about to jump. And yet suddenly we end up with all these info dumps um, you know, we have the thing about the hand grenades. I mean, that's quite exciting that people are holding hand grenades. But then we end up hearing all about the people with the hand grenades and who they were. Um, and I think with several seconds possibly to live or to actually be risking your life, I'm not sure you'd be looking around and saying, oh, that's where I used to live over there. You know, it just seemed there was a lot of stuff kind of crammed in. Um, and and some of the, the sort of bits of detail, I think bits of detail are really useful to, to give flavour. Um, but I think some of the bits of detail that came out weren't useful bits of detail, like a privately owned balcony. You know, there may have been a particular reason for that, but there, there were quite a few things like that, that, you know, it was just extra words which didn't seem to be doing anything useful. So I think I probably yeah. wouldn't turn the page. I'm no, sorry. No, I don't think I would either, actually, unfortunately. I was looking forward to that a lot. Um, so it's going to be, put, put your pretend publishing hat on, what's it going to be here? Oh, um, I'm going to call it an MS, because I reckon with a bit of a bit of pushing around, a bit of, and as you said, the rereading aloud, I think it really just helps such a lot. So I'm going to call it an MS, because I think with a bit of, with a bit of beating around with a stick, it would be all right. Yeah. Beating around with too. a red pen. <laughs> so. Me too, near miss. Um, Amber wants more parkour. Tim James says near miss as well. I think we're coming. Not any we're... popcorn. Yeah. Oh, popcorn. I thought you said popcorn. <laughs> I thought it was time for snacks. 
I think Amber would love some more popcorn, actually. (laughs) I think she would. Um, I was trying to to inject as much um, action into into that reading room. I haven't seen this before. Um, It was clunky to read. So please, you know, it's only a few hundred words. Please read these things out before you send them in. Just, it helps me, but... You know, you're going to get such a negative reaction from from the business if you don't do that. If you just send stuff in and people are, you know, giving it their attention and it just doesn't work. And, you know, it's, you may think it's small, but it's actually quite irritating. If, because if, if, you are, after all, you know, you're supposed to be a writer. You're supposed to really care about the, the small things. Um, and if, if there are problems with that, especially the first page or two, then most people in the business are going to say, well, this, this person is ex- expecting me to invest my time in this manuscript and they, what, but when they haven't, you know. So they are quite small points, but they really do have quite a lot of influence. And you need to, the thing to do is just read it aloud. Get somebody else to read it aloud, read it aloud. Or, of course, prototype it in the colony. Um Thing is, for me, I mean, where are you going to pick? I mean, the we didn't really get into the story. I was just looking at the um, the uh, but I was nearly said synopsis of the blurb. Um, so we didn't get into that. What you decided to do when you started that um, was you wanted to get us into <clears throat> into an action sequence. Um, so I think. What would have done it for me would have been if, if you had a, if if the camera had been inside our protagonist's head, and if I'd have come out of that feeling that I had I, I either experienced something or knew something I didn't know previously about parkour. Um, if you'd have pressed one of those two buttons for me, I'd have gone, oh, okay, yeah, interesting approach here, but it didn't. So that's going to be a near miss for me. But still, we've got all these other op- options here. Um, some of them a bit rude. <laughs> and we haven't used any of them yet. So that's good going. That's good going, isn't <laughs> oh, it, actually? Yes. So, um, yeah, I'm an, sorry about that. I think that um, I was very excited about it. And I don't know if those comments are helpful. I mean, let me just say this is a good moment to, to mention that Pop-up submissions is, is kind of a different format now, hopefully a little bit faster. Just look at the initial impressions that your manuscript creates. Um, but in the colony, in Just for Latopians, we're also going to be doing about once a month, probably on a different day. I don't think on Sundays. We'll have to take a poll to see what day will work best. We're going to be working on submission surgery, which is an in-depth look at really just a small number of manuscripts, maybe just two, three maybe, and looking at the whole thing synopsis, covering letter, things like that. So that is just for Latopians. If you want to take advantage of that, you've got to join the colony. But thank you very much for that, Iman. Now then, um, what do we get to look at next? I don't know. I do know. That's what we're going to look at. Um, we're going to look at Diary of Candice Medovich. And this is from G. Franklin, who says um, he's got a lot of indie novels, actually. In fact, let's have let's have a look. Um, I can show you. Um, let's just go forwards. Oh, well, that's a blurb. I mean, wow, that's micro blurb, really. The Black Sea, the White Sea. Where does our love begin and where does it end? And... That's um, that's one of G. Franklin Prue's books. George Prue, actually. He's, I, can, I can read that on Amazon on the left. And on the right, um, we've got, I think, the author himself. Having a party, guys. <laughs> it's party time with George. And good for you, mate. Um, all very interesting stuff. A nice, short Slightly incomprehensible, but interesting blurb. Hmm. I'm intrigued. 
苍龙。Okay, so I'm slightly thrown because it says Gypsy at the top, but it's not actually. Just did a double take there to make sure we are actually looking at the right submission. We are um, George, if I may call you George. So let's get into this. My husband, Detective John Husker, sleeps with murder every night, but this night the world kills his love and tries to kill his soul. I told you time and time again. He stewed and punched her in the eye, shocked her, <clears throat> and kept her fear close to him. So close that she was afraid to hear her own heartbeat. She struggled as he pressed his body between her breasts and thighs. He struck her twice. Candace felt a punch to her gut. Death was coming as she split open like a juicy tomato. Wow! <laughs> That's a bit much. He just needed some milk to go with her death. I told you time and time again. He whispered his voice over her body that was covered with blood and new perfume mixed with death in her emerald green eyes. And every time I tell you, I'll stab you over and over again. Without a scream, her eyes became two black ice cubes. His gloved fist broke into her chest and stomach as blood gushed over her blue turtleneck dress. She became a picture of his out-of-pocket life. Not sure I understand that. His shadow came off her. Is this going a bit magical realist? And he left with a gloved knife. And he left with her memories as she lay in the arms of the warm sofa. He hovered, turned the lights off so as not to see her blood on his nice threads. He got a beer, paced a Tchaikovsky played on her stereo. It's a bit seven again, isn't it? He caught the delight of her death in his throat until he gulped it down, took the bottle with him and coughed all the way out the door gone in his car away from Utica Road. Peeled away, he breathed her cold night ghost from his lungs. Very poetical. He sped off. Carefully stopped at the red light. It was all a movie he was witnessed early in the morning. What? It's wrong. <laughs> Could you fix that, please, George? Quietly, cautiously, like an old woman, scaling church steps for a prayer. That's a nice image. He hid the bloody knife under his car seat, glanced in his rearview lights from a police car drove around him. See, that, that, that didn't work either. That needs, needs tweaking, doesn't it? He whistled. One of the sleepy blue boys nodded his way. He smiled back. He tapped his thumb to some Benny Goodman's swing on the radio. This closed the doors to her death. It was as if he was going to wait for the sun to come up or the cop would come knocking on his windshield. Shit, he would have to kill him. It took small breaths as beads of sweat dripped on his white shirt. He prayed for the green light, pressed the gas as a black night melted into his soul. My Haverford was a heartbreak, was a heartbreak city. It's a city of good and evil that you could eat just one meal of death at a time on the Connecticut River's shores. On Tuesday, February 12th, 1994, this battle would begin in the foul grey box, vomit stench, interrogation room number 202. Come on, Husker scratched his jaw. You telling me and my... So, yeah, that's really... You've got to pay some attention to the presentation here, George. So, you see... It just, it just doesn't, it's not right, mate. It's not right. <laughs> You've got an excess of, of inverted commas there. Uh, you telling me and my partner here, quote, quote marks, um, that you were s steeping, sleeping, surely, when baby Andrew was killed. You should get somebody else to prove it if you, if you don't want to. That's what I'm telling you, Detective. Mr. Tim Timothy Jelly Eyes. Mr. Timothy Jelly Eyes were brown wood slits. His chin was fat and his eyes told them he was tormented. He was still smug, like he didn't mind the over six foot dinosaur of a detective in his face and his black bear of a buddy. You two bore me. So you've got to, I'd, I would start that on a new line and I think I'd take that little space out there. Otherwise it looks like you're closing quotes from a previous line that didn't exist. And we've got all sorts of different types of quotes here too, in fact, haven't we? We've got very small curly ones here, slightly bigger curly ones there. I don't want to get into that kind of detail, but it just, you know, it, it does count. Son of a bitch, you like little girls, Husker said. We got you on child porn and fucking boys in Honduras, Brazil, Belize and Panama. You motherfuckers don't understand shit, Mr. Jelly pounded his fist on the table. 
Okay. <laughs> right. Now then. Time of truth. Ellie. Turn the page. Um, <laughs> no, absolutely not. You're not no, going to turn the page. The page. No, I'm not going to turn the page on that one. Um, I, I think I mean, there was an awful lot to be done. You know, it's grammatically incorrect. It was clunky. It, you know, there was no flow. I, I suspect what he was aiming for was to be, you know, to produce a piece of literary fiction with, you know, all these wonderful images, etc. And, and all it did was was make it incomprehensible, actually. I, I didn't really know where we were going at all. Um, and, and there were just so many inaccuracies that it... it it, it's a courtesy to the reader to get it right, to get your grammar and your punctuation and stuff right. Um, and, and and it hadn't happened. And uh, no, I, I had no idea where we were going with it. So, yeah, no, uh, so you no, didn't I like would, that. So it's going to be, would, you, what, what's it going to be? I'm afraid it's a barge pole. It's my first barge, barge pole. pole. I'm, very, I'm very sorry. No, I, I, I just, I had no idea what was going on. And it, it just seemed very sloppy. <laughs> So I'm really very sorry. Okay, well, well, Ali took sure great exception to that, chat, George. So. You'll be pleased to know. Mm. Uh, you got a strong reaction there, George. Um, strong reaction. This is a good thing. Yeah. Well, no, no, it's um, not. Good I have thing. to say, I, I found bits of it actually rather good. Um, it's definitely a pass for me. Um, but someone in the chat room has gone by very quickly now. Um, Katie says vigor and flow. I agree with that. Um, <laughs> Carol's with me. <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to find uh, your writing divides people, actually, George. Uh, Katie also says he writes the brio, structural errors, but he takes chances with language. He does. He does take chances with language, and I like that. Um, like I think a writer needs to. It's not unmusical listening to it. That's right. So there is, I, there's definitely something there, something going on. You're a writer, George. Um, but there's too much to dislike. So, um, yeah, definitely passed from me. Um, I, I think you laid it on a bit too heavy sometimes. The, uh, the, uh, the poetical use of language, it feels like you were trying a little bit too hard, but some of that is not bad. Some of it's not bad, actually. And um, I don't get a very clear voice coming through, but I, there is a voice. You've definitely got a voice there. Definitely got a voice. You just need to develop it. Rich has a writer, but not a storyteller. Interesting, interesting distinction. Harsh for me to say, well, no, no. Yeah, it just needs a lot of untangling, really, doesn't it? I mean, I don't yeah. know how many people really thought yeah. they knew what was going on, but yeah. you know, it certainly could join me. I, and even yeah, things I like see, the blurb. I mean, the barge pole, absolutely not, because I do, I do see some interesting writing value there. All right, okay. So, mm. um, I'm sticking to my barge pole. You, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, George, you've, you've bitterly divided us. <laughs> Congratulations on that, at least. Um, I do see some, um, some interesting stuff in your writing, though. But uh, gotta gotta keep doing it. Get that voice going. Get that voice going. Make it. Oh, there is an interesting voice you've got. Develop it more. But um, even the blurb. I mean, all it said was love. That was the only word that actually counted, wasn't there? You know, something like that needs yeah. to draw us in a bit better. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. The blurb was intriguing, but nothing. Nothing special, but there was some. I, I, mm. I would hold half a candle to George for his his um, <laughs> his, his use of language. Actually, there isn't okay. a half a candle option. No, you're right. Thank you, Ali, for injecting <laughs> reality. <laughs> Nothing if not real, are Ali? Exactly. And this is where we are next. And I've got to say, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, actually, because it seems to be like the kiss of death on something. But I've been looking forward to this as well. <laughs> See, that's the thing. If you if you get people, I mean, that you, you, it, this is something that goes on in, in publishing, that you, you, know, you do raise people's interests and expectations and they get emotionally involved in things just in the sizzle of something and then you know if you deliver something that doesn't deliver on that then you actually do the opposite you disappoint them so i was very interested in this 
Um, let's look at the... This is science fiction. It's called Shackleton Crater by Jodie Rawley, who was a total mystery. Total mystery. All Jodie says about... I, don't, I was going to say herself. I don't know. Could be, could be he. I've dealt with a number of Jodies who are males. Um, all Jodie says is very mysterious. That's it. The mysterious Jodie. Let's look at the blurb. In the 14th year of a new century, the fate of an embattled Earth is in the hands of men marooned at the South Pole in Shackleton Crater. If you think this is a 100th anniversary retelling of the 1914 British expedition to Antarctica, you are correct. If you think you already know how this story ends, you are off by a quarter of a million miles. Would you read a book with a blurb on the back like that, Ali? Um, I, I think the concept is intriguing, that you know, you think you know where we're going with this, but no, but I think it's not well put, put it that oh, way. Oh, you, I, I, you're hard no, to I, please. I would. <laughs> what's, what's wrong with you? I don't, I, I quite like the fact that he's almost chatting to the reader. You know, if you think about this, you know, I, I quite like that sort of human touch, as it were. And I do like the fact that, you know, he's basically about to prove you wrong and you think, yes, you know, I just, huh. I don't know. I don't like the phrasing. I'm not sure I can oh, phrase yeah. it better myself. Gee, well, I, I really, <laughs> I'm not I mean, it's turned me on. I mean, it's, it's got I my, uh, okay. it's got my hackles. Um, no, my creative my juice is flying. Is, yeah. Let's have a look. But, okay, um, let's, let's so it's actually it on, on Kindle. I mean, if anything that you see, right, okay. gentle viewer, if anything you see um, prickles your interest, then you know you can get it on Kindle right now. Shackleton Crater by Jodie. And uh, Jodie sent a website, which I've got to say is the worst website I've seen for a long time. It's horrible. I don't know what it is. But it, look, it looks like some sort of placeholder. I don't know why he sent it. Ghastly thing. Oh, that's the thing on the right there. But Shackleton is that Crater. Your okay. Yeah, yeah, quite. <laughs> Constructive criticism on that one. Yeah. Well, destructive. <laughs> uh, <laughs> destructive well, criticism. Nothing if not negative. Make sure that there is a website and, you know, can be. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to send a website, you should send, <laughs> you should send something that's kind of half decent. That's awful. Um, but I've got high hopes. Let's see. Shuggle and Crater. Commander Cad and his crew have three rendezvous. What? <laughs> I suppose. I don't know how you spell that. <laughs> I've never, I don't think I've ever had to write that word. Rendezvous. It should be rendezvous. It's a neologism. <laughs> it's a new word, isn't it? It's rendezvous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. It's got pretty written down there. Stuck me there halfway through the first sentence. <laughs> I'm going to say rendezvous. But I wouldn't, honestly, I would have chosen a different word there because, you know, you don't want, you don't want people to be stuck off with way through the first sentence. They're Orion derived capsule with a 1980s space shuttle, Space Hab. TM. A second capsule and crew docked almost simultaneously at the other end of the empty, windowless, pressurised space hab TM cylinder, which was modified with three docking ports. Ten Americans, mostly old friends and colleagues, floated into the brightly lit white room meeting space between the capsules. They greeted each other with smiles, good wishes and handshakes. They'd just launched hours before and none of them experienced the giddy euphoria of weightlessness in the years since the manned space programme ended. In the weeks preceding this secret gathering, rockets launched from Florida and California. The uncurious population was satisfied, hearing that the launches were classified. <laughs> that scans, satisfied and classified. Information flowed <laughs> through this. Stop it, Ali. <laughs> flowed through the. Jeez. National Geospatial Intelligence Agency in Washington, D.C., so no one outside the White House could put the pieces together. The Space Lab TM, man capsules, and a collection of boxy <laughs> modules, all painted and faceted for radar evasion, parked in orbit behind a huge defunct twin dish communication satellite. In the small room, capsule commander Admiral Vincent Andrew cheerfully asked, So, who knows why we're here? Cared with a shy apologetic smile answered i'm afraid that's my cue he was reticent with a good reason he took printed orders from his brass pocket and ceremoniously broke their seal a signal to the man that he was as much in the dark as they 
He gave a deferential glance to Admiral Anger before reading. It was a gesture the men welcomed. Anger was the most senior, capable and accomplished man among them. Dr Caird, an academic, was not even an astronaut. In the eyes of these men and the space community at large, <clears throat> he was a history teacher and a failed space visionary, a lecturing idealist without political power. He had basked briefly in a glow of notoriety when his ideas and discoveries were first published. He lived under the shadow of being yesterday's news. <sighs> His capsule companions were not only shocked to see him when they arrived at the launch pad that morning, they were nonplussed to learn that he was their capsule commander. Admiral Anger had gone momentarily wide-eyed when he saw Caird float into the space lab TM, but then Anger beamed his celebrated smile. He shook Caird's hand. I'm pleased we got to the end of that paragraph, actually. It's a bit dead. Caird looked up from the page. From the president. He cleared his throat. When he saw the first words, the expressive area around his green-grey eyes, grey-green eyes, flinched, a brief involuntary signal of a surprise and fear. He glanced at Andrew again, then lifted the paper and his chin for better composure. He raised his voice as well to compete with the low air pressure in the module, which, along with fans and life support systems, gave the spacecraft the acoustics of a flying jetliner. He read formally, Orders for Dr Timothy J. Caird, Mission Commander. He did not look up or slow down or acknowledge the man's reactions to those words. You are to lead a flight to the moon and establish a permanent base. The Chinese government has revealed its plan to occupy the moon later this year and nullify the moon, an outer space treaty of 1968. Unless you succeed, key nations will recognise Chinese sovereignty over the moon and all extraterrestrial bodies. You may understand yourselves to be representing a coalition of partnered nations. Your top secret mission is to be carried out with utmost care to remain undetected. Land and establish a lunar base and await the arrival of the Chinese. Just before they land, you are to turn on your radios and... (laughs) (laughs) Oh, the suspense. We'll never know. (laughs) What happened after turn on the radios? Sorry, I've lost it now. Well, there's an author who took us at our word. I think he cut off halfway through the sentence. You could give us just a, if it's a, if it's a question at the end of the sentence, definitely give us the end of the sentence. All right. Pop it on. Yes, a pop um, it on. Yeah. So, um, Ali, turn the page or disengage. I'd actually disengage. I'm afraid I'd, the the beginning bit, in fact, the bulk of it, read like a news bulletin. It, it didn't seem to have much of a human touch. It was more as if it was it was literally just a, a factual report on most things, um, and and there was quite a lot of of over description. That that Doctor Cairn in the middle of that one that you were Cairn Cairn get his name right. Cared, God's sorry. Sake. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Concentrate, girl. Um, yeah, no, I mean, he, he took up five sentences, you know, describing him. And, and clearly, if he's a main character, we would need to know quite a bit about him. But I think five sentences all in one go is probably probably pushing it a bit. Yeah. And even things like the, the, um, the, the bulletin at the end, I think was quite a useful ruse to break up the tempo in some ways and, and to information dump. But it didn't break the tempo because the bit before had sounded a bit like a, a news bulletin too. So so I found it heavy, put it that way. Mm, I'll find so it heavy. I wouldn't read on, I'm afraid. Yeah, I find it a bit very heavy. Um, thing is, uh, Jody, the mysterious Jody. The thing is, Jody, um, point of view, please. Simple. You've got to get into the point of view thing. And if you don't, then. As somebody said, I think it might have been Tim. I don't know who it was. They're all talking about something else now. See that? That's not good. That's not a good sign. If if the chat room sort of diverges from what we're doing, not a good sign. Um, I think Tim said. What did Tim say? He said, "I think he, uh, from memory, I think he said it reads like a technical manual." Um, so Jody, point of view. You've got to read up on point of view. Um, and if you don't, then you ain't going to get a deal. Ali? Um, certainly, it's definitely not a call it in. I'm going to call it a Nimis. Really? I, I don't know. I mean, the, well, I don't know. I think the premise could work. I, I mean, was very I think, excited about know. the premise. I like the blurb. Yeah. I like the title. Yeah. And because of that, it's one of those occasions when you get excited about something. I should never get excited. Yeah. I should have learned my lesson by now. Don't get excited because <laughs> I just get Absolutely disappointed. Right. 
Um, yeah. But don't, you know, I don't know if it, if it actually did um, get tidied up an awful lot. I agree it needs to, an awful lot of tidying up. But I mean, the I idea think, I, would work potentially. Do you not? You're not uh, in that. Um, I'm very interested in the idea. I love the title. Uh, I, I love the premise of the blurb. But frankly, at the moment, I'd rather watch paint dry because I think <laughs> I it was gonna too go dull, actually. Without an understanding that. point of view, it ain't going to work. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, Jody. Thank you very much for sending it in. And keep on working. Um, what are we going to do now? <laughs> We're going to do the Pong of Power, which is comedy. I, I'm, I'm, pleased to, I'm pleased to hear it. It is comedy. <laughs> uh, the title like that, I'd hope it would be comedy. By Mark Hanlon. Thank you very much for sending this, Mark. Um, and let me tell you about Mark. Um, Mark's an interesting person. He's been a lawyer in the city of London. And he's also a healer. Now, you don't often... That's sort of like diametrically opposed to lawyering, I would have thought. So that's very interesting. I, I'm always... You know... Why do we ask about the um, the author? Um, let's just go back for a moment. Why do we ask about the author? Because it does count, actually. It does count in the pitch. If there's anything interesting there um, that just sticks in the mind, it just helps to position you. So that's an interesting paradox. Um, we don't, what we don't want is we don't want uh, a CV because they're the most boring things in the world. But any... Cocktail party sort of stuff. If you go to cocktail parties, I haven't been to a cocktail party for ages. But I don't have a little black dress anymore. Um, it's that sort of thing it's that kind sticks of a in my mind. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it's you know just it's that paradox between between a lawyer and a healer. Very interesting. Um, it's those things that um, or you know parkour. Um, it's that kind of stuff that that. I guess ultimately, actually, what you know, what we're looking for further down the line is stuff that the publicity people can say, "Oh, yeah, we, we can we can build a story around this. We can interest, you know, the media in this." But it's that is further down the line. I think initially it's about um, making your person, making you stand out as a person. Let's. let's I think you've just it. insulted all lawyers and called them all heartless. I'm not sure. So. <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. I love, yeah, I love, I love black. my lawyers. We deal with lawyers all the time on contracts. They're wonderful people, and they've got such, they've got hearts right. of gold. They're lovely. I thought that was your dodgy past that was making you have constant, all this contact with lawyers, but it's not it. it? Oh, sorry, sorry. Let's, con let's concentrate on Mark. That's oh, what geez. Mark says on his blurb. What would happen if an ordinary person were elected prime minister? The book covers the bumbling antics of the old lady and her rise from obscurity to the highest office of the land, just as everything falls apart. <laughs> Teresa. Um, the new and inexperienced Prime Minister faces the collapse of the worldwide banking system, a bubonic plague outbreak in the UK, and as the Russians invade Europe, she is forced to consider the use of nuclear weapons and the start of World War Three. Welcome to your comedy, guys. Um... Let's have a look at the sample pages. Got a, this is very tough, right? Standards are very, very difficult for, for humorous writing. I've said this before. If you can do it, if you can raise a chuckle or two, then you are, you are doing well. Here we go. Chapter one, disaster. One day in 2013. Look at the size of that one, dear. I exploded. Oh, yes, it's enormous, isn't it, dear? Sorry, I'm maybe doing a Frankie Howard here. Blustered the old lady. She was semi-speechless in shock. I've never seen one that big in ages, not since I was a girl, back in the 1870s. It was now 2013, you've said that. Just quite how old was she? Well, yes, dear, and it looks like a rocket has gone up it. What, dear? The economy, dear, I spluttered, exasperated. The old lady paused. Is that what we're talking about? Oh, well, yes, I suppose. There was a wishful sigh, as she had clearly been somewhere else in her gin-addled mind. I was reading out the latest manufacturing figures to you, I said, and the latest services purchasing managers index figures, not to mention the latest construction industry expansion figures. Huge, absolutely huge. All of them. I think you would agree, dear. 
She was still hopelessly confused, and there was a tingling sensation in her voice at the thought of whatever enormousness she was thinking of. Vast, dear. They are indeed of an enormous vastness. I don't know where to begin at the thought of such an overwhelming big one. It was quite disturbing to listen to. But I could barely contain my enthusiasm. Dear, I'm trying to talk about the economy. Don't you know what this means? After years of grinding recession, at this point in 2013, it looks like the British economy might be emerging from the doldrums at last. Look at these huge economic growth figures. <laughs> Finally, she got on topic and saw what I was getting at. Oh, well, yes, I see what you mean. After years of uncertainty and terrifying fears of redundancy, it looks like our jobs will be safe. A rising economy, dear. Firm at last, strong and stable. Hooray! Our middle-class lifestyles can continue. We're safe. Now she was becoming animated, too. I can spend again. Like an old lady of my age and income should, without any fear of redundancy now. Of my age and income should, without any fear of redundancy now. I might have to pop out to John Lewis and buy a middle-class rotary ironer and maybe an enormous new floral middle-class moo-moo or housecoat for lounging around in my middle-class house. But yes, our jobs are safe here. A rising economy. It's the end of the Great Recession. The old lady paused in her monologue and suddenly she sounded, she sounded a different note, somewhat horrified at the new enormity of a terrible thought that had just struck her. But I suppose, dear that if things are picking up economically at last, at long last, I'll have to do some bloody work in this place, she huffed in disapproval. Oh no, dear, I reassured her, you haven't done any work in decades. A little economic boom that isn't going to change that. Quite right, she snapped. I've been used to doing nothing in the office for so long. I can't bear the thought of starting anything work-related now. Anyway, it's 2.30pm. It's home time. See you tomorrow, dear, for another day of grind in this cesspit called employment. And off she went home at 2.30 in the afternoon. It's true, of course. We just escaped from the biggest economic, economic collapse since the 1930s, barely hanging on to our jobs. It all started with the banking crisis of 2008. A massive 8% fall in economic output. The economic collapse was worse than the 1930s on some measurements, but that all depended on who you talked to and how long you could stay awake for the answer. Hmm. Did that tickle your ribs? Do you want to turn the page <laughs> or otherwise? No, I think I'd disengage, I'm afraid. I, I found, again, it was... It was it was really quite heavy. Um, there was a lot of repetition. I, I think the art of humour is is kind of you know leading your reader along one road and then going in from somewhere else, and without without giving them enormous amounts of detail and and that really just didn't. You know there was there was a lot of repetition. We um, it relied very heavily at the beginning on the double entendres, and then that actually, Too much. The, you know, the whole heavy, big, enormous, yeah, yeah just batted yeah. on and on and on. It's very, it was very um, Frankie Howard. I hope you appreciated my delivery. Oh, Mrs. <laughs> <laughs> it's very Beautifully Frankie done. Howard, wasn't it? Thank you. So, and there was an awful lot of telling rather than showing, so I, yeah. I didn't find it humorous. And even things like the blurb, you know, a blurb that's telling you about a humorous story should itself be funny. Um, which it wasn't, you know, it, it just again told about the story. So, uh, you know, I'd have liked to see a lot more sort of quirky, a lot less, a lot less words. It was just wordy. Mm. So, no, it was a okay. no for me. It's a no, and more specifically, it is a... I'm going to go for paint dry. Mm. I actually, I did find it just heavy, and particularly since it was supposed to be humour, I was supposed to be laughing, mm -hmm. and I wasn't, I'm afraid. And I like to laugh. <laughs> um, I can't disagree with anything the chairman has been saying. Tim says, I think you could cut half of that without losing anything. Rich says, some Monty Python. <laughs> Katie's funny. I wonder if I could scroll back. Let's have a look, see if we can get this. I'll see Katie there. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the Americans in the chat room like it. Isn't that interesting? They they like it. I guess the flavour of human humour is just often different, isn't it? On the two sides of the pond. Um. Yeah. 
，可以去设计 work work mile 啊。OK， so look， um， Mark， I'm going to what am I going to go for？、I'm、going to say not my cup of tea， all right？ Um， Ali's going to watch paint dry. I'm just going to have a different cup of tea. Um. <laughs> Is what you're trying to do, Mark, is really hard.、Um, you know, I mean, you pick up some classic. Let me start again. You pick up some、um, some books by classic comedians, Spike Milligan or whatever. They're not all funny. It's really hard to do humorous writing. If you can do it, you can make a bomb. It's so hard. You know, I mean, you're you're trying to unite. The tastes of a very disparate sort of、um, readership in order to build enough people to make it commercially successful. Very hard. And breaking out without a platform as an unknown. It's you know it's it's hard even for someone who say is big on the stand up、uh, circuit. If you've got a television series, then it's easier. But it's just you know I mean. I don't want to sound like I'm saying don't try, because that would be just very, very pessimistic. But、um, I think it would be just wonder how I, if I was really determined to to write humorous material, how would I try to break in?、Um, I think I'd probably try some other way than than books. I might even try, you know, screenwriting. That's a funny thing to say, but.、Um, You've got a concept for something that you could sell to a producer, maybe through an agent. It's a good time to sell ideas for series. Very, very good time.、Um, I do it like that, and then then you could go to a publisher and say, "I created Father Ted," and they'd say, "Here's your book deal."、Um, but just coming in, you know, it'd be one in a billion, really, who's who's going who's going to succeed like that. So I can't I can't give you sort of false hope on that. It's not my cup of tea.、Um, it's too serious. Your loyalty background is showing through. I cannot find anything funny about the banking crisis, and you know you go into too much detail on that. Also, I've got to say, just you know, when I was reading it, I、uh, it was it was the the each voice was rather difficult to develop. So you know, there are two there you got two people call, calling each other dear, which I think was supposed to be part of the humour. I couldn't really tell who was who. Actually, and I would have characterised the voices a bit more if I was able to do that, but I wasn't able to do it. So, sorry, Mark. Wish I could be more encouraging.、Um, I, would go I like the premise, though. <laughs> I don't know if it's strong enough, really.、Um, an ordinary person、mm. becoming prime minister, and that ordinary person hasn't.、Mm. Well, she does seem pretty ordinary. <laughs> I, I don't think there's there's nothing unusual at all, nothing out of the ordinary about you know some skiving politician going home at two thirty.、Mm. They all do, don't they? That's what they've got special <laughs> policy advisors、exactly. for to do the work. Anyway,、okay. I think I think we're going on too too long because we're clearly boring the chat room. So sorry about that, but it's going to be not my cup of tea. Thank, but thank you very much, Mark, and keep on sending stuff in. But but maybe vary it around a little bit as well. As well as This is interesting. It's a picture book by Anthony Buckle, whose name is strangely familiar. I'm wondering if if I've read anything by you, actually, Anthony. Very familiar. Very familiar.、Um, let's look at your blurb. Stuck is a picture book, picture book story, picture book story about Zach, an autistic boy who frequently gets stuck in his thinking, just like his best friend Samson, his pet dog. It's an educational book written in a very simple and accessible style to teach children and adults about the challenges of rigid thinking, a problem we are all prone to in differing degrees. I believe this book has universal. This isn't. The blurb is <laughs> still is is <laughs> you could you could put that on on the back of a book. I believe this book has universal appeal and will do well internationally as well as here, as its theme is one that we all need to think about and engage with more. I hope you love it. <laughs>
Thank you, Anthony. I hope we do too. Um, so I'm already thinking curious incidents. Oops. Let's have a look. That'll be a short pause while I find your file. Here we go. Hi, my name's Zach. I like dancing and football and ice cream and playing with Samson. So I'm not going to read the picture descriptions. But you can read those. Maximize your screen if you haven't already, and then you can read along. Samson is my best friend. He loves to play fetch. Running and fetching, running and fetching. He never tires of it. He used to do other things like play with Mr. Cow. But now all Samson can think of is playing fetch. It's like his mind has got stuck. Even when he's so thirsty that his throat feels as dry as a desert. Even when he's offered a delicious bowl of cool fresh water. He won't drink. Not when there's a chance someone might throw another ball for him. My mind can get stuck too. Several years ago on holiday, Mum and Dad wouldn't let me have a big ice cream like they had. It made me mad and I couldn't stop thinking how unfair it was. I threw my mini milk on the floor, shouted and stomped off. Shouting and stomping off when you're two or three is fine. It's called a tantrum. Trouble is, I'm eight, and I still do it. Yesterday it happened again. I wanted a yoghurt, but there weren't any left. My mind got stuck. I couldn't stop thinking about how unfair it was and had a tantrum. Dad was briefly able to distract my mind with an ice-cold glass of water. And my mind got stuck again. Got stuck on how I didn't want to go to bed. Mum kept telling me how tired I was, but I, could st but I couldn't stop thinking about how I had to stay up. And I felt like I had to hit Mum. I don't know why. Sometimes the wires in my brain feel like they're in a mess, like a ball of spaghetti. Mum told me recently that I have something called autism and that many people have it. She says it's my brain, that my brain is in fact wired differently. That makes sense. But people who don't have autism can get stuck too. My teacher, Mr. Jones, parks in exactly the same space, every day. And this is what he looks like if his space is taken. I think he's having a mini tantrum. The glue in autistic brains is just a lot stickier, I guess. Hunger, noise, demands and tiredness often make things more sticky. You can help me get unstuck. Keep things simple, routine. Don't talk too much. Give me space. Be patient. That's all. Zack. Samson and Mr. Cow. Yeah. Hallie. Uh, I think it's a concept for a picture book. You know, opening up that type of problem is is not is a good thing. Um, however, even in a picture book, you should really have a story arc, and that just came out as a moral lesson, just teaching the world how to to react, which I didn't think was you know it's not really picture book material, and I don't see people reading it and loving it and reading it fifteen different times. Um, I thought some of the language seemed to be a bit old for picture books, and some of the concepts that the child clearly was apparently supposed to understand seemed yeah. a bit old as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah. think, you know, the, starting off, you know, relating it to the dog and the dog being stuck, I think worked quite well. I think a child would kind of see that and see how that then translated into a human. Yeah, I, I was more um, interested no, in the dog, I, actually. Yeah. No, no, <laughs> yeah. seriously, I was. So, I, no, I, I thought, yeah. yeah, I thought there's potential yeah. with that. And, and the story, yeah. I mean, I, I agree. Um, and the chat room is making some very good points, too. I, I wanted more story. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, rather than just a, a lesson, as it were. And because uh, I mean, there's one concept brought out, but I think mm. you could do better without. Yeah, so. I think so too. Uh, Chris L says, I've grandkid two and a half years. She'd walked away. No story, lesson. Yes, true, 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 true. Um, yeah. So, Anthony, um, would you like more story, please? Could you just do that? <laughs> um, Curious Incident, of course, comes to mind always. Although I think Mark Haddon has gone on record with saying he didn't specifically write it about autism or Asperger's, but clearly is so. Um, so you've got a sympathetic audience out there. <clears throat> you've got people who know more about autism now than has ever been known. 
You've also actually, I can't, you know, I've r- racking my brains when I was reading that to think of the publisher. There is, there might be more than one publisher. There's definitely one publisher. You may well know, actually, Anthony. You may have books by them who kind of specialise in this, actually. Um, they're quite a small publisher. I can't remember their name. I want to say Buckminster Fuller. It's not Buckminster Fuller, <clears throat> but it's um, it's a publisher with a similar name to that. You probably know who it is. You probably should talk direct to people like that. But um, a script for a story, just in general, I'm leaving aside autism, a script for a storybook is challenging because <clears throat> um, obviously, it's, uh, sorry, the picture book, you've got to have pictures and... You know, I mean, there's there's always it's like um, it's like top acting talent. There's there's enormous amounts of actors around there, huge numbers. The majority of whom, ninety percent plus, are out of work. But the top actors are in enormous demand, and producers compete to try and get them. And will wait sometimes. They'll put their films off for years to try and get the top people. Same is true with illustrating. If you get a really strong picture book illustrator then publishers will often wait a year or more um, just to get hold of the right person. Um, I always think it enhances the prospect to go in with at least an idea of how the picture book is going to be illustrated, if not with some top-of-the-range illustrations, but it's very hard. And the worst thing, I think, in the world is to go in with some pictures that are not good. That would kill it. Um... No mental image, says Chris. Yeah, okay. Um, said enough about that. Um, so I guess it's, what is it, a near miss or not your cup of tea or what? I'm going for a not my cup of tea. I, I, I don't think it, it didn't cut it for me. Yeah, I, I'd agree <laughs> with that too. It's not my cup of tea. Um, it could have been. If you'd have um, allured me with the story, it could have been. So I hope that's helpful, Anthony. Um Keep working, mate. Guess what? We're the last submission. And it's interesting because this is the first of the new formats pop-ups we're doing. <clears throat> so we, you know, we've had nine. This is going to be number nine. Um, the Little Gods Who Cool the Earth. And that's just as well because my voice is starting to crack up. And um, we're going to have to choose one, actually. We're going to have to choose the week's winner. Now, let me just explain before we we get into this in any detail. Um, Whoops. So every week, irrespective of whether I or my guest call, they can call in as many submissions as they want to. I can too. If we have, say, nine, and I think I think the lesson is tonight that we we'll probably only will be having about nine, because um, I'm not sure we can move much faster through them, really, and do them justice. Um, if we have nine brilliant submissions, nine of them will get called in. If we don't have any that... Either I or my guest doesn't, you know, doesn't, they, want to, they don't want to call in any. Then none will get called in, simple as that. What we will also be doing, though, each week, irrespective of whether a submission gets called in or not, is we will be choosing, as long as the quality is good enough, if it's not, then we won't. We will be choosing the pop-up submission winner of the week. So I want to tell Ali about that now. So while... I'm reading the next one. She can be thinking if she wants to decide on a submission as the uh, pop-up winner. I'm going to think about it too. There's been no collusion. I suspect we're going to come to different verdicts, in which case I don't know what to do. (laughs) I really don't. Well, I'll have to win. Oh, really? Wow. Okay. All right. Okay. We'll duke it out. We'll duke it out. Um. This week there is there is one I think that is that is outstanding. And I want to give the submission of the week award to. Um, so we're just going to talk about that afterwards. But right now, let's go back to the little gods who cool the earth. And this is from Jeff. I don't know what uplet thriller means. Uplet. 
I don't know what that means. It doesn't mean anything to me. No. Maybe it's <clears throat> new fashion jargon out there. Maybe all the kids are saying it. I don't know. Um, blurb. Lewis. Lewis Proctor, a maverick rock star of aristocratic origin, has a plot to stop climate change. He kidnaps the daughters of an oil company boss, hides in the silly isles. Isn't that where you are, Annie? <laughs> where, where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Channel Isles. Channel Islands. Oh, Channel Islands. Islands. Is is that yes. different? <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm. Yes, oh, no, it's oh, a bit okay. different. It's different. Oh, it's a shame. Mm. Um, South here. Mm. Rich, I don't think it is, are Jeff? I honestly don't think it is. Um, I thought it was originally, but I don't think it is. I don't think it is now. Um, the girls escape and Proctor is imprisoned. On release, he discovers his real enemy as a secretive network of mega rich men, Illuminati, Intent on selling their vast oil reserves, which will ravage the planet. In a daring deception, Proctor imprisons and hides this network, neutering its power, and starts an avalanche of popular uprising that begins to cool the earth. Well, um, yeah, interesting blurb. Very nice title, I think. I like that a lot. Um, so let's have a look at the writing, shall we? Whoops. Here we go. Those last moments of innocence were a time of glee. Sapphire ran down the gangplank of Lewis Proctor's yacht, dragged by Imogen, her seven-year-old sister, towards the sole house on that tiny island. Palm trees, huge trumpeting tropical flowers, bougainvillea, so un-English, yet only a day's sail from Cornwall. They were here for the party of a lifetime, which Lewis had promised would be gilded with celebrities. Safa often thought back to that moment <clears throat> before she realised she'd been kidnapped, letting her memory bask in the last moments of childish innocence before she was tipped into mayhem. Before the unborn bellowed in her ear, before the fate of civilization was dumped in her lap. Her sandals were too loose for the pace that Imogen was setting, her hands still sticky with sea salt from the yacht rail, and her overnight bag was swinging wildly beside her. Gulls the size of turkeys squawked alarm from the chimneys. Leonardo DiCaprio will come, I bet, squeaked Imogen. And Kate Winslet, Titanic, totally the best film ever. Titanic was made ages ago. That'd be ancient now, too old for parties. Sappho was just 18. The, chic, the thick chevron of her eyebrows and her long, elegant face lent her an air of aristocratic grace. I put an of in there. Her hair shone blue-black and was cut in an unfashionable bohemian bob. Holding her hand, seven-year Imogen, OK, so I got that a bit late, looked every bit her sister, a near copy except for her hamster cheeks and high-pitched voice. She ran beside her big sister with a rangy, gleeful gait. Safa was not used to being away from the fussy overs oversight of her father, so today's new freedom was a thrill. Lewis Proctor, who ambled up the path behind her, was more of her dad's generation. She had been taken to some of Proctor's late, later Hyde Park concerts, <clears throat> and his music was the family soundtrack to weekend breakfasts and car journeys. It blasted from the terrace of their holiday villa in Morocco, even though her father spent very little time there. Safa laughed to herself, recalling a comment her sister made to Proctor on the yacht. How come someone who's so silly gets to be so famous? Lewis Proctor was delighted by this remark. Well, shall I let you into a secret? He replied. If you think like everyone else, you become like everyone else. So you do what everyone else does, and you don't stand out. To be really famous, you must think completely differently. But then, everyone thinks you're daft. Imogen had looked away with a frown, which lifted suddenly. Sometimes I do silly things at school, she said like raise the toilet seats and the girls, so you think boys have been in there. Safa laughed and flushed a little. I think that's unconscious humour there. Uh, Jeff flushed a little. <sniffs> toilet seats. Let's move on. Great, you're on the right track, Proctor replied. Trick. Safra and Imogen had breakfast in the garden, the sun already high on this summer morning. From their vantage point on an ancient pear tree, two pigeons cooed softly over the symbolic garden. When the meal was finished, Proctor looked nervous. 
His wife Alexis cleared the dishes away and disappeared into the house. Lewis shuffled uneasily, his eyes switching from girl to girl. They sat across the garden table from him, bubbling with anticipation for the promised party with its galaxy of stars. Sapphire and Imogen were only faintly disappointed to find the grounds of the house showed no sign of preparation. They'd expected to arrive to a bustle of people with tents, tools and trestle tables, but there was no one else about. Okay. For the last time, <laughs> on this inaugural uh, pilot uh, edition of Pop-Up Submissions, Ali Gardner, do you want to turn the page or disengage? I think, again, this one's a tricky one. I, I think there's quite a lot of, of interesting stuff, and I think it could continue into a good story, um, but it's actually quite slow. We, we've got a lot of information just being crammed in again. Um, so I, I think I'd be prepared to turn the page, um, but I do find it, I find it a bit slow. I mean, things like even the blurb was actually quite complex, and I mean, Snappy's good, and, and it really was quite heavy. Um, but there are, you know, there's some lovely little touches, like gulls the size of turkeys. You know, you can see that. <laughs> <laughs> inside your head um, and there's quite a few sort of slithers of character and um, interesting stuff fun things um, sliding through but there was quite a lot of sort of um, um, density to get through so mm. I thought Imogen came out quite well in that she did sound and appear to act and think like a seven-year-old um, yeah, I think she was quite well done. Yeah, um, but no, I, 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 I guess I would read on and hope that it picked up a little bit. But certainly, I, it it doesn't seem to be going where there's not much action. We do, we don't seem to be going very far. Put it that so, way. So it's going to be. I'm going to call it a, a near miss. I, okay. I I don't think I'd be fascinated by it, but I think I'd be prepared to see where it went. Um, it's sort of um, not my cup of tea, sort of minus, actually. It's somewhere between not my cup of tea and uh, paint dry. Um, I'm a bit <laughs> more, yeah, I'm a bit more critical than you are. Um, I don't understand the genre. Um, I don't know what uplit thriller means. Uh, that man. Yeah, it means nothing me. to me. I think <laughs> Chris has got a chicken outside the window. <laughs> Ah, um, this is potentially genre fiction for young younger readers, I think. Um, I know the sort of publisher who who could do something like this. I think it would have to be polished for them. I can't see. See, they're talking about something else now. They're talking about laying eggs. That's always a bad sign. Um, so it hasn't set the chat room on fire. It doesn't set me on fire. I think genre, genre fiction for younger readers probably but I don't know what uplit thriller means. Mm. And I think you may, you may be, let's have a look at, oh, we've got a bit more about Jeff actually. Um, yeah, so we've got, some of Jeff's books are on the left on Amazon about teaching. He's got a nice little uh, line in books and a good publisher there uh, about teaching and also his website <clears throat> is, um, as about teaching as well. So clearly that's his forte. And I'm guessing that's who you're writing for. I hope you're writing for that, you know, for the younger reader audience. But uplit thriller, I don't know what that means. And um, if you've got literary aspirations to this, that's completely wrong. You shouldn't have. They're talking about fertilizing eggs now in the chat room. We probably better be off. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Uh, there remains just one thing to do, actually, Ali, and that is for us to have a bitter and rancorous discussion over the um, submission of the week. So I'm, I'm girding my loins, I'm girding my teeth, and I'm going to hear what you've got to say about that. Okay, I'm going for Shaper's Circle. By whom? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go that far back. I think it was about number one, two. Um, it was the one um, that was taking place in some not prehistoric time, but a long time ago with a girl who was pregnant and the pig who massacred the pig, very sadly. But I did feel there was actually a fair bit of storyline to that and and it did seem that it would go somewhere. So, So 
You are expecting a fight from me, aren't you? Yes. Mm. I'm not going to give you that pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. Oh, that is the one that I've picked you. out. That's the one I picked out here, actually. Uh, you can't see it. Excellent. Yeah, I've, I've kept we go. That. That's exactly what I thought. Mm. I'm delighted because we haven't always agreed tonight. Mm. No, That's absolutely. exactly, 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 exactly what I what I picked. Um, this is Rich Joseph Adams. You are the first <laughs> pop-up submissions winner of the week. And and even better, Rich Joseph Adams is unanimous, actually. Exactly so. Ali thinks that, and I think that. <laughs> and I'm delighted. I'm delighted. With, I'm really, really tickled we both mm. feel the same way, actually. I'm very, mm, very is. happy about that. It did stand out. It did stand out. Mm. It, and... It stays with you. It stays mm. with you, because you you can mm. you can recall it now. You've been exposed to seven eight nine, and you can still remember it. That is exactly. The, mm. That's the the test. Which is going. He's in the in the mm. chat room. He's going to have a heart attack. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> nice. I'm very pleased about that actually. Um, now what's what's going to happen, guys? Is um, as we uh, do more and more pop-up submissions new style, there's going to be a separate page on the sort of outer layer of Latopia that's very, very public-facing with all our winners and links through to their work if there's any websites and so on and so forth. So if anyone sees this in the years ahead, um, this might be the breakthrough moment, moment who knows, for, for some up-and-coming author. The first time their work was publicly recognised, um, all you've got to do is to go to the Latopia website and you will see a link there. I don't know what the link's going to be yet, actually. But there will be a link to it. Um, and you can find out about um, Rich Joseph Williams and his website and his... Williams? Adams? <laughs> and his website and everything else. So um, let's hope we discover some interesting talent there tonight because that's kind of what we're about as well. I write because I have to and because I want to entertain. What good words. Nice sentiment. Good feeling. Um, guys, thank you very much for being with us tonight. I think it's um, actually gone quite well, considering it's the very first of the new format and I've got no end of buttons to, to push and stuff. Um, I've got to say, we're not doing it next week because I'm travelling, uh, which is a pain. I wanted to do one next week, but we're not. So it means it's two weeks' time. It does give me... Um, I'm still. I'm going to have um, another guest from Latopia, please, next week, uh, in two weeks' time, because I'm still not totally confident. And actually, it's all behind the scenes stuff. It's the stuff that the buttons I've got to push and all this that, and the other. Um, so we may be doing another pilot from maybe two more sessions before we actually start to get the trade involved. But I want to say thank you to everyone in the chat room for your common sense and brilliance and enthusiasm, and especially for my very special guest tonight, who does hang out in Latopia from time to time. And if you want more of Ali, then there are lots of podcasts that we used to do with Ali. She's on lots of those, on those shows. Um, thank you, Ali. You've been wonderful. Oh, no, it's been it's been huge fun. It's, <laughs> it's, it's lovely not to been be bad, has it? I've really enjoyed it, no, actually. No, it's yeah. been, it's been yeah. great. No, it yeah. really has been good fun. Lovely. So, and I agree about the chat room. Thank you. It's always lovely when um, Brilliant. we get comments coming through. So. Oh, they're expressing their gratitude mm. right now. Oh. So how about that? Everyone. You, I don't think there's anyone who's saying that you, your, your opinions are completely wrong. <laughs> cool. All right, guys. That's it. See you in two Great. weeks. Not one week. I'm sorry about that because I'm traveling. Two weeks' time. Same time. Same place. Lots more submissions. And um, thanks again for being with you. Catching the colony during the week. Night, everybody. Good night. Good night.